Um, delighted to invite the um, Attorney General and Minister for Justice and Leader of the House, uh, Yvette Darth, to, to speak. Um, it was also wonderful to um, hear her talk about the fact that everything we sh do, should people should be front and centre, and that doesn't often happen, and it's wonderful to hear those words come from the Attorney General. And I think that's particularly important when we've got a human rights bill that's in front of Parliament. So without any further ado, just to invite the Attorney General to the stage. Thanks. I think we might need to adjust the mic, just, just saying. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's a very high lectern too. Um, good morning, everybody. Can I start by acknowledging the traditional owners of Turbo and Jagua people and pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging? And in doing so, can we acknowledge that we meet on the lands of uh, what is uh, the longest continuing living Indigenous culture in the world? And uh, when we talk about citizens of this country, we remind ourselves that the first Australian citizens are our First Nations people. Uh, in Queensland and in Australia, and we must recognise that uh, at all times. And of course, what we're talking about today certainly seeks to do that as well in recognising uh, those cultural rights. Can I acknowledge, of course, Mark Henley, CEO of Queensland Council of Social Services, and thank him very much for organising this event today and emceeing uh, James Fowler Community Legal Centres Queensland. Uh, to Amy McVeigh, Human Rights Act for Queensland, an incredible advocate uh, and champion of the human rights. Uh, of course, additional panel members that we'll hear from today, Hugh de Kretzer, Executive Director of Human Rights Law Centre, David Moody, State Manager of NDIS Victoria, and Simone Jackson from the Department of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Partnerships. Uh, can I acknowledge all of the organisations that are here in the room. Can I also acknowledge, I know there's uh, department representatives and statutory authorities. I know Peter Kahn, our public trustee, is here as well, and other government agencies. We have representatives from the Anti-Discrimination Commission, soon to be the Queensland Human Rights Commission, uh, here as well. And although uh, our focus is predominantly talking about uh, the role of non-government organisations here today, of course, uh, very importantly, our uh, broader government agencies will have a critical role uh, in implementing these reforms. My, my starting message, and, and should I say before I do talk about the important um, issue that we have before us today being human rights, I just want to take a moment and acknowledge those people around Queensland today who are doing it very tough, uh, who are potentially facing losing their homes, uh, those who have already lost their homes or businesses, uh, and what I hope, um, no loss of life uh, in these very uh, devastating fires that we're seeing around our state. Queensland, we know, faces natural disasters of all types, uh, and we're seeing it again this week. Uh, but the fire is just one element. The heat wave that we are having um, is extraordinary. Um, we are seeing record temperatures around the state and they're not just going to be one or two days. Uh, this will carry on for a number of days and we know the pressure uh, and the risks that put on people. And conversation with my parliamentary colleagues earlier this week was that more lives were lost in the South Australian heat wave than the devastating Victorian bushfires, and we must always remember that and hope that when we talk about human rights, it's, it's thinking about people and uh, asking people to look out for their elderly neighbours who might be isolated in their home and check in on them uh, and look after them during these difficult times. Can I also um, acknowledge and thank our Auslan interpreter that is here today? Uh, and also the fantastic work that they do. And again, while I've been watching the Premier and Fire Services uh, giving their reports, uh, and whenever we have those reports uh, around natural disasters and getting that message out to the community, importantly, we have our Auslan interpreters there making sure that we are being inclusive and that we're getting that message out to everybody. On the 31st of October, 
I had the great pleasure on behalf of the Palaszczuk government to introduce the Human Rights Bill into the Queensland Parliament. I acknowledge that for many of you who have advocated on behalf of the most vulnerable individuals in our community, this reform has been a long time coming. Today I'd like to take the opportunity to briefly outline the scheme of the bill, discuss how the bill will impact on non-government organisations and share my thoughts on how the bill might be relevant to a variety of your client groups. I think my message and the government's message is simple. A human rights bill is not something to fear, it's something to embrace. Everything we do should put people first, whether we are government and government agencies, elected members of parliament, or we're operating in the private sector. Ultimately, we should be always looking to our customers and our clients, our patients, putting them first in everything we do. So government agencies shouldn't fear this. Non-government organisations should not fear this. I know um, any organisation that is well established uh, and works well with their community already puts people first, the individuals, their families first in the decision making process. And as a responsive government, you cannot be responsive without listening, listening to the community, listening to families and individuals, and making sure that they are first and foremost in your mind in the decision making process and in the way you go about your job each day. So the Human Rights Bill that Queensland has introduced into the Parliament. The primary aim of this bill is to ensure that respect for human rights is embedded in the culture of the Queensland public sector and that public functions are exercised in a principled way and is compatible with human rights. <coughs> this reform is about resetting the framework that guides how decisions are made within government and ensuring that human rights are a key consideration in the performance of public functions. Significantly, in addition to the 23 human rights, the bill also recognises, through the preamble, the importance of the right to self-determination for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples of Queensland. The term compatible with human rights is a key term used throughout the bill. An act, decision or statutory provision is compatible with human rights if it does not limit a human right or limits a human right only to the extent that is reasonable and demonstrably justifiable. This is in keeping with the international covenants from which the protected rights in the bill are derived and an acknowledgement that human rights are not absolute and are subject to reasonable and justifiable limits. The bill follows a dialogue model of human rights, promoting a discussion or dialogue about human rights between the three arms of government, the executive or public entities, the legislature and the judiciary and creates an obligation for public entities to act and make decisions in a way that is compatible with human rights. Importantly, the courts cannot invalidate a statutory provision and cannot remediate or rewrite a statutory provision to make it compatible with human rights. It was important to ensure still the sovereignty of the parliament. The bill requires public entities to act or make a decision in a way that is compatible with human rights. In making a decision to give proper consideration to a human right relevant to the decision. It is unlawful for a public entity not to comply with this requirement. Consistent with the Victorian Charter, there is not a direct right to take legal action against a public servant or a public entity if they contravene the Human Rights Act, but by not acting or making a decision in a way that is compatible with human rights. Rather, the bill establishes a new ground of unlawfulness under the Human Rights Act, which is available whenever an applicant has an existing right to claim a remedy on a separate ground of unlawfulness. This is sometimes referred to as a piggyback claim because an applicant can attach a human rights claim onto an existing claim. The remedy available for a piggyback claim is the one the person would have entitled to on the basis of the existing claim, even if the existing claim is not successful. This approach is consistent with the regulatory model established under the Human Rights Act, which aims to build a human rights culture in the Queensland public sector. It favours discussion, awareness raising and education to encourage compliance with human rights rather than a strong enforcement and compliance model. Unlike the Victorian Charter, the bill will allow individuals who believe that a public entity has acted 
or made a decision that is unlawful under the Human Rights Act to make a complaint about the public entity's conduct to the new Queensland Human Rights Commission. The Commission has provided a dispute resolution function under the Bill with the aim of resolving complaints informally through complaints handling and conciliation. This model of dispute resolution aims to provide an accessible, independent and appropriate avenue for members of the community to raise human rights concerns with public entities with a view to reaching a practical resolution. For those of you seeking more detail about the technical aspects of the Bill, including the key terms and concepts and important provisions of the Bill, I would encourage you to go to the parliamentary website to look up the legislation where you can access the explanatory notes to the Bill as well as the Bill itself and importantly contribute to the parliamentary committee process that is currently being undertaken. Now I'd like to turn to how the Bill will impact on non-government organisations. The Bill imposes obligations on public entities to act and make decisions in a way that is compatible with human rights. The term public entity includes core public entities like state government departments and functional public entities when they are performing functions of a public nature on behalf of the state. This recognises that many public services are not delivered directly by government, but by a range of non-government entities who enter into arrangements with government to deliver public services on behalf of the state, for example, an NGO providing a public housing service. This means that NGOs will be included in the definition of public entity if they are performing functions of a public nature and the functions are being performed on behalf of the state or a public entity, whether under contract or otherwise. In order to provide certainty, registered providers of supports and registered NDIS providers under the Commonwealth National Disability Insurance Scheme Act 2013 are specifically included in the definition of public entity, but only when they are performing functions of a public nature in Queensland. As you all know, Queensland follows Victoria and the ACT in introducing human rights legislation. And in developing the Queensland Bill, we have had the benefit of experience of those two jurisdictions in implementing the human rights framework in public sector decision making. What is clear is that in Victoria and the ACT, the public sector and public service delivery did not grind to a halt when the human rights legislation commenced. The public sector has continued to operate and a new dimension has added to how decisions are made. In the 2011 review of the Victorian Charter, the Victorian Council of Social Services indicated that the implementation of the Victorian Charter of Human Rights and Responsibilities 2006 did not have a significant impact on community service organisations. Many organisations reported that they already adopted rights-based approaches in their policies. VCOS reported in their submission to the scrutiny of Acts and Regulation Committee that the Victorian Charter has encouraged them to implement and strengthen a human rights-based approach across all policy and practice areas. When I say that community service organisations didn't have significant impact, that doesn't mean that their decision making didn't have a significant impact and made real um, demonstrable improvements in the way that services were delivered. The rights-based approach that many of you already have in your policies and decision making frameworks reflects human rights as a core value. This approach mirrors the decision making framework we are working to establish more broadly across the public sector with the Human Rights Bill. In practice, this means that in preparation for the commencement of the Bill, public entity NGOs should review and potentially modify, if necessary, existing policies, programs, guidelines and decision making frameworks to ensure compatibility with human rights. It will be useful for organisations to update their compliance <coughs> processes so that mechanisms are in place to receive, identify and respond to complaints about human rights. As I said earlier, in the first instance, the public entity, or in your case an NGO, will have the opportunity to resolve the complaint directly with the individual involved. If not, the complainant takes their complaint to the Queensland Human Rights Commission. The NGO will be given an opportunity to provide a written response to the complaint and may be required to attend a conciliation conference. Legal representation will be permitted at a conciliation conference at the discretion of the Commissioner and it is intended that this discretion will be exercised when it is in the interests of justice to do so, for example where the complaint is complex 
or where the parties are happy to have legal representatives to attend the conciliation conference in order to facilitate a resolution. For many of the most vulnerable complainants, this will ensure that they are not disadvantaged in the conciliation and that they have the best opportunity to contribute to the process. To assist NGOs in understanding their obligations, the Queensland Human Rights Commission will have educated functions, including reviewing public entities' policies, programs, procedures, practices and services in relation to their compatibility with human rights, promoting an understanding and acceptance and the public discussion of human rights and the Human Rights Act of, in Queensland, making information about human rights available to the community and providing education about human rights and the Human Rights Act. Provisions establishing the Queensland Human Rights Commission are proposed to commence in mid-2019, which will allow the new commission to commence high-level community and public sector education and engagement about human rights. Provisions placing obligations on public entities and courts and the parliament are proposed to commence on 1 January 2020. I should say, however, that as a government, we're not sitting back and waiting for this bill to be passed through the parliament and enacted before we start putting in place the processes to change those guidelines and policies across government agencies. That discussion is commencing right now to prepare us so that we will be ready for that 1 January 2020 commencement date. Finally, I'd like to talk about the real impacts of the Human Rights Act, and that is the impact it is expected to have on the everyday lives of some of the most vulnerable in Queensland's communities. I'd like to provide you with a number of examples from the Victorian experience where human rights legislation has made a real difference in the lives of everyday people and provide you with some thoughts and observations about the potential impact for some of the important client groups that you are involved with. With the exception of perhaps rights for children in the criminal process and cultural rights for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, the bill does not contain specific rights for specific groups of people, nor are particular groups of people such as women, people with disabilities, victims of crime or others specifically named. However, the bill does include a right to recognition and equality before the law. Clause 15 states that every person has the right to enjoy their human rights without discrimination. It reflects the essence of human rights that every person has, the same human rights by virtue of being human. This right also makes it clear that measures taken to assist persons who are particularly vulnerable do not count as discrimination. This right to equality is both a standalone right and permeates all human rights in the bill. It both prohibits discrimination but also permits affirmative action or positive discrimination in the case of our most vulnerable community members. In Victoria, since the commencement of the Charter, while there have not been an extraordinary number of cases before the courts, Many of those cases relate to access to justice and the right to a fair hearing, particularly for those that are vulnerable within the justice system. For example, self-represented lit litigants and people with disabilities. There are also a number of reported cases related to housing and homelessness. For example, challenging eviction orders sought by public housing authorities. For example, cases where eviction or notices to vacate were successfully challenged on charter grounds include where a wheelchair-bound man with a mental illness who spoke a limited amount of English was evicted on the basis of evidence gathered from police about a drug-related allegation, even though the man had not been charged with any offence, which denied him the presumption of innocence and procedural fairness. And also where a single mother whose boyfriend had been convicted of growing illegal plants on the premises was given a notice of eviction, which failed to take into account her right to privacy and her right to family life. And I can think of particular examples of people I've met over the years in my local community where a person may be evicted because they're in a domestic violence situation and damage has been done to their house by that violent partner and has left that person unable to pay the rent and having to pay compensation for that damage to the property and potentially facing eviction and worse still with young children. In other cases, the, the right to equality before the law without discrimination, including discrimination on the basis of intellectual disability, the right to liberty, the right to privacy, and the right not to be subjected to medical or scientific experimentation or treatment without the person's full, free and informed consent, have been raised and considered in relation to review of 
decisions related to compulsory medical treatment and involuntary administration of med medication or treatment. In some of these cases, the original decision has been validated because the relevant human right was considered that the limit or treatment was considered reasonable and justifiable in all the circumstances. In other cases, the original decision was overturned or remitted to the decision maker for reconsideration because the right had not taken into account or the public authority was not able to demonstrate that the limit or treatment was reasonable and justifiable. It is all about shining a spotlight on human rights and ensuring a more systematic and transparent consideration of an individual's right in their interactions with government. Other than the reported cases that is outside the courts and litigation, there are also numerous examples of the Charter contributing to better outcomes for women, people with disabilities, and people from diverse cultural backgrounds through improvements to decision-making frameworks to properly incorporate consideration of the Charter rights. At a local government level, there are examples of consultation processes being changed so as to ensure that minority groups are included in discussion and decisions relating to urban design. The Victorian experience demonstrates how a human rights culture and public sector decision-making can be used to ensure that individuals with their varying uh, abilities and cultural backgrounds and regardless of gender, sexual identity, income or where they live are treated equally and with respect. And how, with human rights enshrined in legislation, proactive, preventative and systemic changes can be made to public sector services delivery. In gathering practical examples of the impact of human rights legislation, I have drawn from the compilation of cases provided by the Judicial College of Victoria, which is available on their website, as well as a document prepared by the Victorian Human Rights Law Centre, Victoria's Charter of Human Rights and Responsibilities in Action, case studies from the first five years of operation, which I commend to you for the insights it provides. And I can't wait to hear from the panel today, and I hope that you are very vocal in your questions today with having such a wonderful panel here to discuss what this means for you and, most importantly, what it means for our broader community. The enactment of the Human Rights Bill will be a vital step towards recognising human rights for all Queenslanders and provides an opportunity to reflect upon and ensure that the human rights of the most vulnerable in our community, many of whom are your clients, remain central to service delivery that is performed by the state and on behalf of the state. I know many of you individually or on behalf of your organisations have contributed to the development of this important reform. But the job is not over. It is just starting. And I encourage each of you to be involved in the parliamentary committee process. Um, it's wonderful to see so many submissions that have already been put in. I know CLC's Queensland put out a social media tweet this morning talking about how many submissions have already been put into the committee and how supportive they are. But you only get legislation like this and real reform like this embedded for the long term when you get the whole community coming with you. It cannot just be driven by politicians. Laws can be changed when governments change. Good laws can also disappear. If you want to ensure that we have human rights embedded in a Human Rights Act in Queensland for decades to come, we need to ensure that we are out there talking about this issue in the community, understanding the importance and sending a very clear message that human rights is not something to be feared, it is something to embrace, that all government agencies, all businesses that serve the community should put the community first. They should think of the people in the way that they deliver that service and the way they go about their decision-making processes. And that's what this bill does. It's about bringing those rights together in a simple, clear piece of legislation to let everyone know in Queensland that we value your rights here and we want to make sure that they are in our mind in everything that we do as a government in our courts, with the executive, and also working hand in hand with our NGOs. I thank you for your support in this very important reform in Queensland. I ask that you continue to have this conversation publicly. I thank all of the people organising today's event. And it is uh, 
a real pleasure to be able to come here to address you today. And if I've still got time, uh, I believe I may be taking some questions. So thank you so much. Good morning.